Okay, so we're going to change gears from what we've been talking about to um, expanding access through global teledermatology. So we've been talking about um, diagnosing things very quickly and being shown a picture and being able to know what it is just like that. So sometimes that's not the case, um, especially with some of the, the sites that I work with. So um, I was just telling my story to someone that I met with last night, and most um, of the cases that I started with were very complex. I started um, working with the Baylor uh, Pediatric AIDS Initiative and many sites in Sub-Saharan Africa when um, the AIDS epidemic had just gotten started, and so I was working with kids with HIV and very low CD4 counts, um, and I, I still do that. I met um, Gary uh, back in 2007 or so when we started um, our AfricaTeleDerm.org site, which I'll mention a little bit later, but the children are very sick, and their skin diseases are not typical, and so of course, there's teledermatology where, you know, you see psoriasis and you're like, psoriasis, move on. But sometimes I'll get a consult and I'll log in and I'll say, oh, let me do this right before I leave and I'll see this. And I'll be like, oh, okay, no, I need to really think about this. So this was a child. I got this consult just about a month ago. Um, so even in, you know, when, when ARVs are accessible in sub-Saharan Africa, um, for the most part, there's still children that are very sick. So I've also done a lot of work in pediatric KS and have um, published a lot of work on what the spectrum of KS looks like in children. And we've noted that some kids have a lot of subcutaneous no nodules. I'm just giving you this little bit of background. So this child initially presented with typical KS. He had the, the purple lesions on the legs, he had the oral lesions, um, and he had a couple, maybe one or two subcutaneous nodules. And so we see so much of it. This is in Tanzania that he was given chemotherapy. Well, uh, a few cycles into his chemotherapy, all those purple lesions went away. And then these subcutaneous nodules proliferated. Well, that's not the typical KS, uh, you know, kind of, uh, pro, pro, the cycle that you get with KS, those subcutaneous nodules should have gone away, right, if they were KS. Well, his kept coming. And he got them on the tongue. They were kind of translucent, and I was like, this isn't KS. Anytime something doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. So he's in a site where there's no access to histology, and we have an uh, agreement with the government that if we need a biopsy, we can get it um, sent to us. So this is what we saw. I put it under the microscope, and I was like, whoa, what is, what is that? Anyone know what that is? Any dermatopathologist in the audience? Oh, that's a good thought. It's cystocercosis. <laughs> Interesting, huh? So not something I would have gotten in the blink of an eye with the Teloderm consult, but um, I did figure it out with the biopsy, and this was critical for this child's life. Um, he probably would have died of this. Uh, so he had disseminated sister cirrhosis. So the story makes sense now. He probably had a little bit of sister cirrhosis, and then when he was put on chemotherapy, he developed disseminated sister cirrhosis. It was in his brain. It was in his gut. It was everywhere. And so um, he was given um, therapy for his parasitic infection, and he did really well. Uh, but teloderm can send you in directions that you never thought possible, and sometimes you can figure it out with a photo, but sometimes it takes a team, and we call it global teledermatology collaboration, of figuring out what to do with the team on the ground, with the team where you are, figuring out where specimens should go, and so it really is a big effort, um, especially when these kids are really sick. Here's another one. Um, this girl was in the Pacific Islands. She was 18 and was about to graduate um, high school and was supposed to, she was supposed to go to college at Arizona State and was really depressed. And, and she had had this since she was little. 
Um, her uh, dermatologist sent me these photos and said they really need to figure out what to do. She had about nine months left in the Pacific Islands before she was coming to the States. And they said she had a biopsy that said she had psoriasis. And I looked at this and I was like, this really doesn't look like psoriasis. There were other photos that looked like it was um, super infected and eczematous. There was golden crust. Um, and I said, let's do some uh, staph eradication. Let's try and soak and smear with some steroids. Um, but they had been going off of this pathology report that was about 10 years old that said she had psoriasis, whether or not it looked like it or not. And about three months later, they sent me these pictures and said, after staph eradication, she no longer noted her skin was no longer red and open. Um, she had been on uh, steroids and stuff that didn't help, but they did have people that could start her on cyclosporin. She was basically erythrodermic from eczema. Um, finally, she didn't, it didn't burn to get into the water. She was more confident. She graduated from high school and could go on to college. Um, and she was, you can see, she was still red and scaly, but it was a lot of LSC. But the differences that you can make if you stop and think about what it is, even if people were given wrong information, sometimes you have to go around that information and not just keep it going, because um, that's what had happened to her. So the global burden of skin disease is thought of as a small problem, but it's some of the most common things that people complain about. And the diagnosis and treatment is important because morbidity is significant. The cost to patients is, is big. So when you render a diagnosis to someone, whether it's in the US or globally, a lot of people will buy things to treat these problems. In Botswana, they, they buy the, these things out of pocket a lot of times, and so if you give them the wrong diagnosis, they're gonna be buying a lot of creams and things, and it's, it's a lot of money to these patients, and so the, the right diagnosis is important. Screening for signs of skin disease can lead to a diagnosis of a systemic disease, and sometimes these things are transmissible, and so it's important to diagnose them. And education is key. So a lot of times we're in telemedicine, we're dealing with um, healthcare workers, um, primary care doctors, and so it's, a, it's an opportunity to um, train them in dermatology, as we've heard a lot already. Um, treatment failure rates for um, primary care doctors in dermatology, and this has been published, is over 80%. And so, this is uh, from a study, <clears throat> and this is in the developing world. So again, it, in many countries in the developing world, there aren't dermatologists, and the primary care doctors or healthcare workers are doing the best that they can. But again, a lot of countries don't have national health care, and patients have to buy these things themselves. And sometimes the healthcare workers don't think about the price of these medicines. When I was in Liberia giving med medical care, we went to the pharmacy and looked at the price of myconazole, and it was 10 times that of gentian violet or other things that would have treated the same condition. And so they don't think about the economics of um, what they're giving. So teledermatology in the developing world, and this has come up because inadequate access to uh, skin care, just like anywhere else in the world. And we talked about mobile telemedicine this morning, which has really allowed for uh, telemedicine to reach the far corners of the world um, pretty quickly. So inter internet-based teledermatology, um, we developed this in, in conjunction with the Medical University of Graz and many other partners over time. This is Stephen Kadu, who I still work with. Uh, we developed this in 2007 as an internet-based telemedicine teledermatology site. It's very, very simple. At the time, we had um, sites that were using dial-up internet, so we had two or three pages that they had to go through um, to just submit a basic history and photos, and that's still how it is today. These are the countries that I work in uh, mainly, and it's free to anybody um, in Africa and really to any developing country that wants to participate, people from um, Mexico or in Mexi uh, under, under um, developed areas in Mexico or Central America, uh, Pacific Islands. I say it doesn't matter if you're not in Africa, you can still use the site. I don't really care. 
So we've done about 1,700 uh, consults and uh, 400 conditions have been uh, diagnosed by biopsy if necessary, like that one you saw at the beginning. Um, in the beginning, it was really important for me to go to uh, the initial sites uh, in person and talk about these, uh, talk about how to use this. Although it's very simple, especially in 2007, it was still sort of new technology and people um, are much more comfortable if you just step them through how to do this. Also, developing personal relationships is very important when developing a teledermatology uh, service. They know who they're sending the consults to and that they can trust that person. Um, I still work with these sites, uh, you know, eight, nine years later. This is an example. This is a little girl. This is something that you can recognize pretty quickly if you know what it is. This is called pityriasis rotunda. It's related to her TB. You can see that she's pretty um, thin and wasted. Um, she had active TB, and when they treated her with four-drug TB therapy, these lesions went away without any creams. This is lupus vulgaris. It's also something you can recognize pretty quickly once you know what it is. It's uh, cutaneous TB. We see it in um, children or adolescents mostly, uh, usually in Eastern Africa, but also in other areas. It starts in the central face, moves out with this verrucous border, and scars everything in its way. Um, pathology, I mentioned a little bit, some countries still have difficulties processing slides, whether it's uh, inadequacy of their histology processing, no histology processing, it takes more than three or four months to get an answer, which is really not helpful. Um, and in Botswana, we have a telepathology scope, we work with the national lab, and, and I read uh, dermatopathology in my office in, at Penn. This is Dr. Kayembe, he's my uh, partner. Uh, at the Botswana lab, and in order to do telepathology, it's really important that you have partners on the ground who um, look at all the slides and only give you the ones that they need help with. Um, you know, you have someone who can process tissue in a reliable way. When I first started doing this, um, you know, the epidermis wasn't always present. Sometimes the tissue was cut in cross-section, and over time it got a lot better. Um, and we have a good government partnership as well. So here's an example. This is a patient um, who had HIV and these eroded plaques uh, all over her body. Um, I took this photo from my office, and you can see that it's cutaneous cryptococcus. So here's an example of another case um, of teledermatology from Botswana. This woman came in. You can see she's got um, does this work? Yeah. She's got this nodule down here on her leg. She's got these black lesions on her knee. And this is the primary lesion on her foot. We see quite a few um, acral melanomas in Botswana. I think uh, a problem is really education. I don't think, um, you know, we have a lot of education in the U.S. about melanoma, but um, there's no campaigns about pigmented lesion on acral sites. And so, Sometimes the patients were unaware, really, that that was something to worry about until the metastases start coming up. This is a patient in Malawi, a child, 12-year-old, with a large soft, soft tissue mass growing on the back. Um, the key was that it, started, it came up over six weeks. The patient had a CD4 count of 17. Um, and so they wanted to cut this out. And I was like, no, don't do that. Um, let's think about this. Uh, I told you that, you know, we have a ton of KS, but KS doesn't typically come up over that period of time. Anyone have any thoughts? I hear a, I hear a, lot, of, a lot of thoughts. That's good. Anything now? Didn't sound like we had many pathologists in the audience, but... <laughs> Let me help you out here. So this is a vascular tumor, and this is a Worth and Starry stain. Digging back deep, back deep in your brains. Anyone? Vascillary angiomatosis. These are the bacteria clustered around the vascular spaces. This is him after erythromycin. Is that crazy? <coughs> yeah. So um, it's amazing what sometimes a, a 10 cent drug can do. And you really want to make sure you assess everything um, first, because 
surgery would have been pretty devastating for this child. But what's interesting, this is another child with basilary angiomatosis. It can look just like KS. This, is, this really can look like KS. And so right now, sometimes um, if we have a patient and we do a biopsy, we'll give them doxycycline or erythromycin if they don't have any history of allergies because it's a pretty benign drug while we're waiting for the biopsy results. This child, after two weeks, almost completely resolved with this uh, disseminated nodular um, rash. Here's another child. Um, this, was a bi this was a telederm case. And if I looked at this, I couldn't have told you what it was, except that it was probably a malignant tumor. Um, we did a biopsy, and it was an EBV-related leiomyosarcoma. Very important to diagnose this patient. Um, usually, these are GI tumors from the smooth muscle. Um, here's the biopsy. Uh, so it's an EBV-related tumor. It's the second most common tumor in, in HIV-infected uh, children. Uh, this child did, did pretty well. It was just surgically removed, but that guided what they needed to do. So um, anyone have any guesses on this? I'll tell you what I thought when it came across my, de my uh, computer. Huh? No. You know what the... You know, that's a great thought. So there's Verrucus HSV. Anal HSV, that's high on the list. That's not what it is. You have the path here, too. That's the dermis with a bunch of cells. Anyone else? So this is the anal area, if you can't. No. So I thought it was going to be a big squame, but that's not what it was. CMV, that's a good thought, too. So they're plasmacytoid, good, but not plasma cells. Say, is that you, Ann? Yes, oh, you're good, good pathology skills over there. So the surgeon said his anus is normal. I was like, what? I don't know what this is. Anus is normal. And she can, he, she can put a probe through this necrotic area into the rectal canal. So yeah, that's a good, but this is a big tumor. And this is Eber. It's an EBV-related plasmablastic lymphoma. So it's a big lymphoma coming from the rectum and eroding out of the rectum out of the skin. So these were seen a lot in the early AIDS epidemic as a GI tumor. We really don't see them on the skin. Um, but it had gotten so big that it came out onto the skin. This guy had a CD4 count of about two. Um, but again, the difference between a squame that needs excision and a lymphoma that needs chemo is a big difference um, for this patient. So I'm going to um, wrap up the last few minutes with the transition to mHealth, which has been really important because it's expanded our, our uh, area that we can work. So um, we started, I started doing mHealth in about 2009 with a flip phone where we were able to take photos and send a text message and meet them in cyberspace and send them to a web. It was very gratifying that you could even do this. And we had a clinic in Philadelphia that was willing to follow the 17 steps to actually do this. But it's that ability to even do telemedicine by a phone, which was incredible. And now, just seven years later, you're doing it on your smartphone. It's really leapfrogged over landlines in these countries. And so we show that um, a few years later that on a smartphone, the patients of Botswana with HIV were accepting of this um, technology. A lot of people were hesitant to believe that uh, mobile phones were going to be um, acceptable in telemedicine. And in fact, the old ATA guidelines didn't like it in 2007, but that's because the technology was old. Um, we've heard about the, the workflow. It's really just the phone replaces the computer and a physical camera. And we've shown that uh, reliability and uh, validity of mobile telederm is good, even for complex HIV patients. And in Botswana, as in many other um, sub-Saharan African countries, um, there's a good infrastructure for cell phones. There's a shortage of, of healthcare workers, and it's the second highest HIV prevalence in the world. And we also have a good um, future workforce with the Botswana School of Medicine, which started um, several years ago. 
So here's uh, a lot of the phone entrepreneurs. Um, you can buy phones anywhere. And in fact, in Botswana, it's more than one per capita of phones. So there you go. Um, and in 2017, next year, over 85% of the world will have 3G or greater. 76% of the 6 billion people in the world back in 2011 owned a mobile device. And here you can see, I think we've heard about this before, that tablets and phones are taking over the PC. And in Botswana, not only um, do we do Telederm, but we do all of the, mo uh, all of the um, visual specialties on mobile uh, devices with the Ministry of Health and other partners. And also we heard from um, the, the learners there that they really needed point of care access to medical information. So we've worked with um, our partners to bring them e-books, journal articles, and, and other things like that to them in their rotations when they go out to remote settings. So um, these are just some articles showing what we've done with um, access to chest x-rays and oral medicine consults. Um, before we did this, they were sending the x-rays physically on an ambulance down to the capital city for a, a, a read, which is sort of ridiculous. And then most recently, we've worked with Microsoft on a, a TV white space project where you can put an antenna like this on a district hospital and it launches um, high-speed Wi-Fi for about 10 miles. And we've been um, working to uh, include um, live and storm forward telemedicine for these district hospitals. And this is the program where we've been training the University of Botswana um, residents and medical students how to access the, the learning resources on their tablets and smartphones. And we've done some studies to show that this, this helps them. And I brought it back to the US. Uh, I talked a little bit about Access Derm, but we've developed a mobile platform in the US with the American Academy of Dermatology to um, help uh, our underserved to have access to, to mobile consults as well. It's a very simple platform. The, the end result is, is to increase access to care in, in um, the US, like we talked about with the last questions um, in the last lecture. And we've shown that we've increased access um, through this platform and that there is also a big discordance between primary care providers and dermatologists in, in our country. So we need to work to improve that. And also we can use teledermatology, particularly mobile devices, to improve triage of inpatients and inpatient care. In the US, a lot of our dermatologists don't want to see inpatients because it sort of disrupts their workflow and the hospitals are sort of far away. So mobile teledermatology can be a way to improve that. And then I just wanted to end with this story. This is a child I was sent this consult. Um, he was in Tanzania. I looked at his face and he has HIV. Um, he had these lesions. He kept running away from the hospital before they could treat him because his mom was having a baby. He wasn't getting much attention and they weren't able to treat him or figure out what he had. He was on acyclovir, wide spectrum antibiotics um, and a, a few other things. And I looked at him, I had, an, had another patient who had blastomycosis with the same eroding um, scarred plaque on the, on the earlobes. And I said, we need to start him on AMFO. Um, let's, he's on everything else except a, a IV antifungal, and he's at high risk for that. So the next day they went to go give that to him and surgery had cut out all his lesions. <laughs> I was like, oh no. So they ended up starting that anyway. Here he is um, doing better, but with these horrible scars. Um, and there's an end result of him happy, but with some, some scars. So sometimes there's not a great communication line in some of these remote um, clinics, but Anyway, this is um, definitely why I do what I do. It takes a lot of my time, and um, when I want to quit, I remember some of these kids, so thank you.